Hey guys, today's going to be the first in our series talking about how to build an OSPF network. Uh, we'll see how advanced this gets based on our feedback. But to start with, you want to start with a great documentation for what you want to build before you get to building it. So some of the softwares that are out there, obviously Visio and Lucidchart. Today I'm going to show uh, app.diagrams.net, which used to be known as draw.io. And we're going to use that to start showing what the visualization of our network is going to look like. So I've already logged into app.diagrams.net. Uh, we've got an untitled diagram here. We're going to call this OSPF Lab. And let's go ahead and create here. All right. So now that we've got a blank diagram to work with, I'm going to just search here for router. And looks like we've got a bunch of different icons we can use. Let's go ahead and grab one. And first thing we have to decide is how big this network is going to be. So I've got a router here. I'm going to copy and paste a handful of routers. And I think let's go ahead and build a network that looks something like this. We've got a router that we'll put in the center who is connected to the internet. We'll drag another guy down one level and say that he's connected to our first router. Then these guys can be connected. And what the heck, let's grab one more. I like this design here. Let's go ahead and use that. We're going to draw some lines here between our routers to show what that connection is going to look like. Uh, we don't really need arrows, so I'm going to come over here and turn this arrow off. And then we're going to take these lines and connect them up to our routers here. One of the things I want to do is uh, have a multi-path capability here. All right, so we've got a visualization of our multi-path OSPF network here. We'll go ahead and connect the internet here at the top. Here's our internet connection. And our next step here is going to be to uh, do our layer three. So we need to put IP addresses here so that our network can communicate and uh, form adjacencies. So I like to use the CGNAT allocated space of 100.64.0.0 slash 10. And I'm gonna document that over here and say, hey, we've got some text. We're gonna use 100.64.0.0 slash 10 to build this network. Uh, this is what we call the transport or transit IPs. And this is going to be the network that uh, communicates with OSPF, which is different than your internet IPs. So we don't have to use public IPs. If you use public IPs, then your trace routes will definitely show public IPs as they traverse the network. But for conservation of um, public IPs, we can use private IPs here to transit our network. So what I like to do is say 100.20.127.0.0/24 is going to be assigned for loopback IPs and 100.126.0.0/16 uh, is going to be reserved for my transport network. So now that we've decided that, uh, we can go ahead and start allocating, subnetting this out, and applying some IPs to these routers. So to document these links, I'm going to go ahead and open up each of my links and say, hey, this guy's going to be 100.126.0.0 slash 29. The reason I like to use slash 29s is so that if uh, Let's say I've got some switches or radio links uh, between here, some other kind of layer two transport that exists between my routers. 
that will allow me to stick a PC on this side and stick a PC on this side, uh, either that laptop or it could be another Microtik or any other device that helps me troubleshoot. And that way I can determine whether I'm having a link problem, a router problem, um, and really get details on what's going on on this network. Also, if I've got a, a you know a layer two piece of equipment here that can take a layer three IP address on it, maybe it doesn't do routing, but we can at least stick an IP on there to do some debug investigation and troubleshooting. Then I can start looking at ARP tables, bridge tables, MAC tables, and see, hey, am, am I getting traffic across this link? And if I've only used a slash 30, um, it's gonna be only two hosts on that network that can do that investigation. Whereas if I've got a slash 29, I can use five different hosts on this network to do some troubleshooting. All right, so now that I've decided on my first link subnet, uh, let's go ahead and use dot one and dot two for my assignments. And what I've got to do next is place an IP address on each of the links and each of the hosts connected to those links. So I used 100.126.0.0. And I'm going to use zeros for connected to the, the main router here. So now I've got 100.126.0. And now we've got an increase by a slash 29. So my next network available is 8 slash 29. We're not going to talk about any subnetting in this uh, class. What we'll do is uh, probably just throw a link up on the screen to a good subnetting tutorial. Uh, maybe we'll make one if there's a lot of requests for that. But so I'm just gonna continue to walk around the network and make these IP assignments. Next up, 100.126.0.16. And one of the things you'll notice is that from the top down, I'm kind of following a pattern of the lowest IP closest to the internet, higher IP is farther out away from the internet. This is just a personal preference. It's completely arbitrary and you can use whatever schema makes sense to you. Next up, 100.126.0.24, which leaves us 25 and 26 for hosts and 32, which gives us 33 and 34 for our routers and almost done. We can now say 100.126.0.40/29 which is going to leave us dot 41 for the near end and dot 42 for the far end. So now at this point, we've got some IP assignments. And next up, uh, I said loopback IPs. Uh, these are going to be our router IDs also. So on an OSPF network, every router needs to have an assignment of an ID. And oh, we, we missed a couple of links here. Let's go ahead and finish those guys out. We're up to 48. So that's 29. I could renumber this assignment so that uh, our IPs really flow top to bottom. But again, it's completely arbitrary. So I don't have any issues with go ahead and assigning a new link. Uh, maybe later on, I add some more routers to the network. Maybe we add another one over here. Uh, I'd hate to renumber the entire network to fit and accommodate a, you know, a scheme when these IP addresses don't matter a whole lot for connecting the network, at least at a small scale. If you get into a large scale network where you uh, need to sometimes route stuff east and sometimes route stuff west, um, then it can be a lot more important to make sure that your schema follows a good IP boundary where you can route that, hey, this traffic needs to go left, this traffic needs to go right. And when you get to that point, something we might do is say, hey, uh, everything here in the east we're going to use is 100.126.0, and then everything in the west over there we're going to use 100.126.1. But for this small of a network, it's pretty easy for us to just go ahead and, and assign based on uh, these slash 29s. So we've got 48, and let's do 49 and 50.
And now we're going to do our next subnet here, 100.126.0.56. And here's 57 and 58. So let's go ahead and next assign our loopback IP, which will be our router ID for each router. And I like to do this just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so we'll go here and start with our main core router 100.127.0.1. And this is actually a slash 32. Uh, it's just a loopback IP that goes on a bridge when we're talking about Mikrotik. So this is literally just going to be one address. Uh, it's not part of a subnet. We'll call this guy router number two. And on we go around our network. All right, so we've got routers one, two, three, four, five, six. And basically we have our documentation done at this point. This will allow us to now log into a bunch of Microtics, set up those networks. Uh, and obviously we need to decide on some physical assignments. So we'll cover that on the next video.